Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining today's conversation with Pat Brown, the founder and CEO of Impossible Foods. I'm Chris Field, director of the Stanford Woods Institute for the Environment, the organizer for today's event. The Woods Institute is Stanford's marquee investment in advancing understanding and developing practical solutions to our era's pressing environmental problems. Woods scholars team with other researchers, governments, companies, and NGOs to build bridges from research to action to address challenges in climate, health, food, water, oceans, and biodiversity. Today's session is part of our conversation series, sessions designed to get behind the scenes perspectives from people making fundamental changes in our relationship with nature. After today's event, our next conversation is next week on March 16th. In today's conversation, we'll be discussing a revolution at the intersection of climate change, biodiversity, diet, and health. Agriculture, and particularly the production of meat, is a gigantic driver of humans' impacts on our planet. More of the Earth's surface is used for grazing than for any other activity. It's now approximately 45% of the total ice-free area. The most recent synthesis from the IPCC indicates that agriculture, Forestry and other land use, a category that's dominated by animal agriculture, is responsible for approximately one quarter of total greenhouse gas emissions globally. This is almost twice the emissions from transportation, more than the emissions from industry, and about the same as the total from electricity and heat. There's no question that livestock casts a long shadow. But that's beginning to change, and it's exciting for me to launch a conversation with one of the people most responsible for driving that change. Today's conversation with Pat Brown will be moderated by Roz Naylor. Before turning the microphone over to Roz, let me say a couple of things about process and then provide a bit of background about Roz and Pat. The format for today's conversation is that Roz will start with a few questions. After about 20 minutes, we'll get to the good part, questions from all of you in the audience. To get a question into the queue, type it at any time into the Q&A box using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. We'll get to as many questions as we can. After the conversation, we'll post the video on the Woods website. Ross Naylor is the William Wrigley Professor of Earth System Science and founding director of the Center on Food Security and the Environment at Stanford. An economist by training, her research focuses on policies and practices to improve global food security and protect the environment. Ross's research projects address a wide range of issues from intensive aquaculture and livestock systems to food price volatility. She currently co-chairs an international initiative, the Blue Food Assessment, which provides a comprehensive scientific evaluation of the sustainability, nutrition, equity, and justice dimensions of aquatic foods. Pat Brown is a CEO and founder of Impossible Foods, a company at the forefront of making nutritious, delicious meat and dairy products from plants. Prior to his current gig as a high-tech CEO, Pat had a distinguished career as a biochemist much of it on the faculty at Stanford. He played a key role in HIV and led the development of DNA microarrays, a new technology that made it possible to monitor the activity of all the genes in an organism. I first met Pat about 20 years ago when he was pioneering new approaches to scientific publishing through founding the Public Library of Science. Pat's research accomplishments have been recognized with election to the National Academy of Sciences and the National Academy of Medicine, as well as the American Cancer Society Medal of Honor. Pat turned to food-based production based on asking how he could use his training and experience to make the largest positive impact in the world. The answer was Impossible Foods, to which he's devoted himself full-time since 2011. Roz, the microphone is yours. Thank you, Chris. And Pat, it's great to have you here. Um, you and I have uh, sort of crossed paths in various ways, but it's really nice to share the stage today. And I think we've shared a lot of our concerns about the environmental impacts of global food systems. And of course, you have taken it so much further with this $2 billion company and really revolutionizing the way that we think. So um, we have tons of questions. We're going to have the audience ask questions, but I thought I just want to start with your personal journey. I mean, a lot of us have focused on impacts of livestock on the environment, but how did you get to where you actually are in taking it into impossible foods? That sabbatical was pretty telling, but what actually happened during that sabbatical? 
Um, well, basically, I didn't set out to work on this project. I was not contemplating doing anything in the business world. Um, but I, I, as Chris mentioned, I just sort of challenged myself to figure out what's the, how can I have the biggest positive impact on the world, given the kinds of things that I'm, you know, uh, competent at doing. And um, I figured it would probably have something to do with addressing big global environmental issues, since I feel like that's, <laughs> that's, you know, the, 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 the biggest determinant of, of the future of um, humans and, and our planet. And when I started looking into it, I very quickly realized that, um, and I'm happy to support this statement if anyone finds it controversial, that the use of animals in food technology is by a very large margin the most destructive technology on earth today um, and very likely the most destructive uh, technology in human history. And um, <clears throat> when I uh, uh, thought about how to solve it, well, actually I made a few lame moves. One is I <clears throat> briefly, I organized a uh, uh, National Research Council workshop um, on the topic of you know, what would be the, the environmental, economic, food security, public health uh, impacts of uh, if we were to completely switch to a plant-based food system. Um, uh, it was a very interesting workshop, but I very quickly realized, once I realized how political that organization was, that you're not gonna move the needle that way. Um, and so that was kind of like the lame academic go-to move. Um, the uh, um, and I actually uh, then I started thinking, okay, well, the way we're going to solve the problem is we're not going to change it with policy. No way. That's 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 never never going to work. It's never worked. We're gonna, we're not going to solve it with education. Um, uh, the people that I've met who are most educated about this issue mostly are are just mainstream meat consumers. Um, and uh, so understanding the problem and knowing knowing the cause doesn't change behavior. Um, and uh, so the, the only way to solve it is to realize what their actual problem is, which is we're using the wrong technology to produce these foods that the world loves and is not going to stop loving and wanting to consume. Um, and, um, and when you frame it that way, actually, it's very solvable. Um, and so um, I just figured that the, the, the way to solve it, and when I found the company, the mission, that we have is uh, to completely replace animals as a food production technology globally, which I think is doable. Obviously, I'm not talking about you know that uh, little farmer in Burundi who's who's chasing his goat around. I'm talking about the the you know kind of global food system, um, and and that the way to do it is is to compete against the incumbent industry, the technology that uses this technology uh, in the marketplace by making foods that do a better job of delivering what consumers value and basically pull the economic rug out from, from under it. And, and again, I feel like I want to just say the mission of the company is entirely defined in terms of the demise of the incumbent uh, industry and technology. Uh, we achieve it by um, inventing a better technology platform, doing a better job of pleasing meat-loving and fish-loving and dairy-loving consumers, if we don't, if we don't make them happier, we don't succeed. But if we do, um, the way we achieve our goal is by crashing the economics of the incumbent industry, just to be blunt about it. And I felt like that was doable. So that's why I, um, I, I quit my job. I made an abortive attempt actually to start the project at Stanford. I wrote a proposal to the Woods Institute for a small grant to fund research I would do basically looking at some of the kind of technical aspects of solving the problem, like, uh, and I was told, no, 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 no. We, we this is a this is a project for industry. This is not an academic project, so we're not going to fund it. So, okay, fine. So they were right. This was a project for industry. That's great. And uh, yeah, you are known to be a disruptor, Pat. And uh, and so taking this industry down, it's a it's a huge industry. And I agree on the policy front, there's a lot of policy backing by that industry. So you're up against a, a, big, um, a big force there. But what I love about your approach is that, um, that you appreciated that people actually like to eat 
meat. And, and there were certain aspects of this, the psychological aspects of eating meat. Somehow you got into that better than anybody I've seen. Because a lot of times there's this idea that just eat something else and you have to get used to eating something else. But you're saying, okay, no, people actually like the meat part. Can you talk a little bit about the psychological part that you delved into and your ingredient of heme, how you actually, you know, really um, replicated meat in the Impossible Burger, why that was important? Well, the psychological aspect, I feel like, is, is not rocket science. Um, uh, anyone who's kind of lived on Earth with other humans knows that that uh, people are, are just not going to be persuaded by um, logical arguments or nagging to uh, change their diets. I mean, people won't even change their diets for their own personal health. Uh, much less for something much more abstract and distant like the, the, the health of the planet. And, and in terms of regulation, I mean, China, you know, uh, about three or four years ago asked its citizens to cut back their meat and dairy consumption by half. And if you look at the statistics on meat and dairy consumption in China, you don't even see the trend. There's no budge in the trend whatsoever with that. And, you know, if anyone's going to be able to get their citizens to do as they ask, it's the, the government of China. Well, that was a fail. And, and the other thing that you point out is that, you know, I, when I was at, it was very striking when I was in Paris for the COP21 thing. Um, first of all, I was the only one there who was talk, talking about uh, this topic, as far as I could tell. But everyone I talked to who was, you know, a climate scientist and so forth said, yeah, actually, yes, it is a big problem. And now we're going out to have a steak for dinner. So, um, you know, and that's just human nature. It's just kind of like common sense. You don't have to be a psychologist to, to realize that that's not how you're going to solve the problem. As far as the heme goes, basically what it, what it came down to is um, what I realized is, you know, the only way to solve this problem is you have to make a product that is better in every way that matters to meat consumers, okay? You're not going to achieve this by mushing some vegetables together or, um, you know, uh, um, something that's just kind of like a a uh, you know thoughtless empirical solution. You have to understand, um, which I, we did not understand. I did not understand. No one did actually. How does meat work in 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 the ways that matter? So I'll just say, cost and nutrition are not a problem. Like that's a solved problem. You know this this year's global soybean crop grown on 0.8% of Earth's land area, contains 50% more protein than all the meat consumed globally. So, uh, and the cost of that protein is less than 5% uh, of the cost on a per protein basis of the cheapest meat uh, on the market because it's just so much more efficient. So from a pure nutrition and economic standpoint, the problem is solved. The hard part is deliciousness. And um, that was the un unsolved part. And amazingly, and, and so I just felt like as a scientist, okay, well, if we're going to make a product that does a better job of doing what meat does in terms of satisfying consumers' uh, uh, cravings and so forth, we need to understand how meat does it, okay? Um, and um, amazingly, you would think that something that is like kind of an obvious thing for people to be curious about why does meat taste like meat? And, and why is meat from any animal immediately recognizable as meat and not broccoli? Um, the, uh, uh, someone would have asked that question before, but I know that no one did. Because basically, the food industry, no offense to anyone, I'm going to say a very inflammatory comment, has zero curiosity, OK? There's no curiosity. Uh, um, there's virtually no innovation. Like Innovation in the food industry is like a new flavor of Fruit Loops. It's, it's um, uh, so I know no one had looked at this because the answer was pretty obvious. Uh, 90, 95% of the answer is why does meat from a flavor standpoint taste categorically unlike anything from the plant in uh, plant world is that uh, the things we call meat have way more heme. Okay, every cell on earth has requires heme as part of its energy generating system and so forth. But animals, because they are so much more metabolically active, they burn more energy. Heme's involved in the, you know, electron transport chain and respiration, and and also involved in oxygen delivery and stuff like that. They need a lot more heme than plants do. And it's obvious that you know meat is red or pink, fish is red or pink, you know, plants are green, and uh, 
Um, they have heme, but very little of it. Um, now, it wasn't obvious that heme was responsible for the flavor, but as any biochemist knows, heme is one of the best catalysts in nature. I mean, the enzymes in your body that, that are responsible for whatever, metabolizing caffeine, metabolizing Tylenol, metabolizing all sorts of uh, toxins and drugs, use heme as the business end. The enzymes that are involved in biosynthesis of all the steroid hormones are use heme as the business end. It's a great catalyst. And, and um, you know, when you, when you eat raw meat or when you bite your lip, that bloody flavor of blood actually turns out to be due to the catalytic of he activity of heme oxidizing polyunsaturated fats, mainly linoleic acid, to produce these um, compounds that are among the most potent odorants known. They're, they're, in terms of on the molar basis, how much is required for you to be able to detect them, incredibly potent odorants, and they smell and taste like blood, okay? And those are produced in real time in your mouth when there's heme in your mouth because they catalyze this oxidation reaction of, of, uh, um, of uh, linoleic acid or whatever. And, uh, um, and when you cook meat, there's something that happens that you know, does not happen when you cook uh, whatever green beans. Um, and that is that instead of it just becoming kind of a little warmer and mushy or something like that, um, it just completely transforms. It produces this explosion of aroma and flavor and so forth. It completely changes its flavor profile. That smells like a catalyst for sure. So before I even, actually, I think it was in my Woods grant that I wrote, I, I, I hypothesized that leg H was, was potentially the catalyst. I mean, that heme was potentially the catalyst of meat flavor and so forth. But um, it was only once we build impossible foods and we could actually do the experiments to prove it. But the fact that no one had done this before, there was not a single word in the literature. There was not a single, nothing in the patent literature. You could Google search it, nothing. Is just a statement about two things. Number one, people just, you know, don't have scientific curiosity about food. They just think food is food is food. It is what it is. Maybe we can get these crops to grow faster, or the pigs to grow faster, or something like that. But anything that's really, you know, non-incremental changes and so forth uh, doesn't happen. So for you guys in the audience who think this is a potentially interesting area, it is wide open for innovation. Every aspect of the food system can be vastly improved because people think of it in terms of, well, let's, let's you know, quantitatively increase the yield. Let's make this same old thing that, that we've been doing forever a little bit better. Um, uh, so it's a huge opportunity anyway. Sorry, that was a rant, but um, yeah, he, yeah. Well, that's, that's, I think that's so interesting because yeah, people love the barbecues. They love going to fast food joints and this is spreading all over the world. I mean, it's obvious that you're hitting um, a real taste preference here and it's so important. So I wanna get into some of the um, kind of challenges that you've probably faced. I can't imagine this has just been a, perfect linear process, you know, of success after success, because there are things, uh, issues that people raise, for example, um, on the nutrition front, as we're eating more starches and so forth, you know, is the Impossible Burger actually a lot better for you um, than having actual meat? And so that that's one of the issues that comes up. And soy, I think in particular, has been an issue many consumers have started to raise questions about. I know you've addressed this in Impossible Foods, but what would your response be on the nutrition side? And then I want to ask you about the economics and scaling and, and making the Impossible Burger actually affordable to all. So you can take either of those questions first. Well, I can, I can take both of them. I mean, I could they're, 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 to answer them in detail is a long story, but in a, in a nutshell, um, from a nu nutritional standpoint, um, one of our core principles uh, internally is that we're never going to make a product that uh, we don't believe from a health nutrition standpoint is better for the consumer than what it replaces. Note that it's better than the consumer for the consumer than what it replaces, not better for the consumer than anything else that they could possibly buy, um, because the goal here 
is not to replace your whatever your kale salad with an impossible burger is to replace um, a burger made from a cow with an impossible burger. And we're incredibly conscientious about uh, health and nutrition, but of course we're constrained because you know if we said, well, here, here's a chunk of tofu, you know, here's why it's better for you or something like that. Well, first of all, not necessarily true, but 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 secondly, that's not the point because the meat consumer is not going to buy that when they're looking for for a burger or a steak or something like uh, something like that. But it does have to be better than what it replaces. So. Um, you know, the first product uh, that that we launched from, uh, you know, kind of high level nutritional standpoint uh, was on a per weight or per protein or whatever basis, uh, per serving basis, uh, lower in calorie, lower in total fat, lower in saturated fat, no uh, cholesterol. We are now very close to having an up and we're constantly upgrading it. Okay. So, um, uh, and, and, and by the way, same protein, same protein quality, you know, like PD cast score, so to speak uh, for the aficionados, um, same bioavailable iron, uh, same or higher, um, levels of all the micronutrients that people, uh, uh think of meat as good source for and, um, higher fiber and, uh, et cetera. Okay. So I think there's a very credible case that that based on what we know from uh, about nutrition and health, this is this is a better product uh, for consumers. I'll just say as an aside, the fact is we don't know as much as we think we know, or as much as most people in the outside world think they know about health and nutrition. Um, when you look at the science behind things, even something like um, uh, saturated fat, and you look at the Cochrane reviews and these groups that. That, that do very large scale meta-analysis. The thing to have to keep in mind is you can't do a controlled study of human nutrition, you know, long-term controlled study of human nutrition. So you can either look at surrogate markers in a controlled study on a short-term, you know, short-term study, or you can do kind of a retrospective case control type of analysis to make inferences about diet and health, as a result of which there, there are only a very limited number of, of uh, uh, strong conclusions you can draw. And, and that's part of the reason why anyone who follows this stuff in the mainstream press thinks, wow, now they're saying this is good for you. Didn't they say it was bad for you last year? And vice versa. And uh, wait, are we supposed to drink wine or not? Are we supposed to um, uh, have high fat diet, low fat diet, high carbs, low carbs, high protein, blah, blah, blah. Um, the notion that there's some kind of like really well-established hard science behind uh, these kinds of things is, is is naive and it's obvious when you when you actually look at what kind of data we have to rely on that's not good. Nevertheless, despite the fact that the, the the data are not as compelling as a lot of people think, we follow the data such as they exist and we hold ourselves to that standard of health and nutrition. You can ask me specific questions, I'd be happy to answer them about, about our nutrition profile. Soy, soy is awesome. Soy is great. I don't understand why anyone would have any problem with soy. There, there was an urban myth that was started about 20 years ago. It was just based on some, some, some uh, very naive interpretation of literature that was, oh, soy is an endocrine disruptor because it's got these, um, uh, 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 you know, uh, flavonoid compounds that that uh, um, are weak estrogen uh, uh, mimics. Therefore, it's going to kind of like make men grow breasts or go sterile or some nonsense like that. Um, it's been extensively studied by the literature, on top of which what we use in our product, which is a protein isolate, doesn't even contain those compounds because they're, they're, they're removed in the process of purifying the soy protein. But, but even if you ate, think of it this way, okay, um, uh, is, is the, the, are these compounds in soy going to... Uh, impair your, uh, if you're a man, your manliness or cause, it's been very well studied by science, but, you know, just remind yourself that the samurais got most of their protein from soy and no one was accusing them of being sissies. So um, uh, it's, it's just like one of these stupid um, popular notions that it traces back to nothing and frankly, it doesn't matter because nobody really takes it seriously anyway. There's so much soy in the food system as it is right now. Nobody's freaking out over this. It's just a handful of people that kind of, uh, you know, make a point, make make an issue out of it.
and so and the cost you know bringing the cost down so everyone can oh the cost Great idea. Okay, think of it this way, okay? And actually this is gonna get into a controversial topic um, potentially which you can follow up on. So look at the drivers of the cost of, of meat, okay? What are, the, what are the inputs? You need land. So we use one, less than 1 25th the land area that's required to produce the same product from a cow. You need water. We use about a 10th of water that's required to produce the same product from a cow. Fertilizers for the feed crops. Our total fertilizer footprint is, is, is less than 10% of the uh, fertilizer footprint of a cow burger. Pesticides, we use less than a 12th of the, uh, we have, you know, less, much less of the pesticide input when you just look at all our raw materials and, and the aggregate data on that compared to the, the cow. We've done a life cycle analysis. Actually, we didn't do it. We, that we had an independent auditing firm do a life cycle analysis. So that's where these numbers come from. Labor, um, the, uh, um, if you make meat from plants instead of animals, you need less plant crops, okay? Because you're turning, you're converting them into meat much more efficiently than if you use a cow to do it. The protein conversion ratio of a cow is less than 3%, um, meaning you have to grow a lot more crops to make, uh, to turn them into a, meat using a cow. So less plant crops, less, less labor required to manage the plant crops, no labor required to manage the uh, uh, animals. So very substantially less labor. Now that could be a controversial issue and I encourage you to pick up on it. But, but the point is the, the economics are so structurally better. Um, the only thing that they have that we don't have is they've already paid for all their infrastructure and, and, and we're paying for it in real time as we grow. Um, and so we don't have the economies of scale, but we know what the, the structural economics are and asymptotically our costs and our prices to consumers will be much lower. Okay, so, so um, the, you, we've got about 30 questions here. So I'm gonna just start uh, diving in and, um, uh, and start asking we have 700 people attending this, so we'll see how far we get. So um, I'm looking at one from Jim Leap, who is the head of the Center for Ocean Solutions with Theo McKaylee. And he said, um, in addressing the sustainability of the food system, many look to the potential of fish. How do fish and impossible meats fit together in your vision for the future of food and for the world overall, especially for poor consumers around the world? Um, first of all, one thing I want to say is that just to, to, to be clear, we're, we're trying to crash the incumbent industry. That doesn't mean that we're going to go out there to the um, fishermen that are, that are uh, fishing to feed their families and stuff like that and snatch away their fishing rods and, or, or, or steal that goat from some you know, poor farmer in, in Bangladesh. Um, we're, we're competing in the uh, global markets. And to the extent that consumers, that we can do a better job of serving consumers, uh, uh, it's, it's their choice. So just to, just, just to be clear. But the fact is that um, fish populations are in a catastrophic situation. Actually, if, could, could you give me two minutes to just show you some, some supporting statistics about the environmental impact of the industry, just to frame this. And then, uh, um, because I think I'll just say something. And 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 this is partly directed at you, Chris. If you look at if you look at the way that uh, um, people in the environmental sciences world, the climate sciences world, look at this problem, they're way off the mark. Okay, they're way off the mark, and 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 they're missing the big the big story here. That's our mission, by the way. Twenty thirty five, we're coming at you. Just take our word for it. Um, this is, this is from the uh, World Wildlife Fund's uh, semi, you know, biannual report. They've been doing this study uh, with, uh, it's a multi-scientist consortium that they lead with the Zoological Society of London. They've been doing this for more than 50 years and reporting on the state of the populations of more than 4,000 diverse animal species around the globe. And what they reported most recently, this was last year, is that, and, and they've been tracking this for a long time, um, is that the total populations of, across diverse species, the number of living individuals on average across diverse species of wild mammals, birds, reptiles, amphibians, and fish, 
on Earth today is less than a third what it was 50 years ago, okay? That is an absolute catastrophe. It's a much bigger threat to the future of humanity than climate change, which is a humongous threat to the future of humanity, okay? And here's another uh, uh, summary from their data, which is what are the causes of this collapse of bio global biodiversity? It's almost entirely the use of animals for food. That's just, that's the headline. In this uh, pie chart, the sector on the right, the kind of teal sector on the right is exploitation, mostly fish. It's, it's hunting and fishing, so overfishing, okay? And I think anyone who tracks fish populations, though, that's the absolutely number one uh, driver of the collapse in fish populations, which, which are less than 30% what they were 50 years ago in freshwater and oceans and so forth. The red on the bottom is uh, habitat uh, degradation. The green is habitat destruction. And uh, essentially, and you heard about the land footprint of animal agriculture, which 45% of Earth's ice-free land surface, by the way, every city on Earth could fit in less than 1% of Earth's land surface. Every human built structure from houses to parking lots to sidewalks to factories fits on less than 2% of Earth's land surface. 45% is animal agriculture. This is animal agriculture and overfishing. Okay. And I'll just and I'll just give a couple more statistics so you can to just drive this point home. There are 1.7 billion cows on Earth. If you calculate the total biomass of those cows and compare it to the total biomass of every remaining wild terrestrial vertebrate left on Earth, the cows outweigh every remaining wild terrestrial vertebrate left on Earth by more than a factor of 10. Okay. So we have literally replaced nature with cows, okay? That's a situation we're in. It's a total joke. And those cows produce less than 12% of the human protein supply. So we've traded nature for cows for virtually nothing in return. And this is the, the, the last slide. No, I think it's my next last slide. This is, this is point raised. I just wanna show you something because there was a question in the queue I saw about sustainable regenerative agriculture or some such bullshit. Um, so this is Point Reyes. This is, uh, my wife and I were going down the, the, the trail to Abbott's Lagoon. This is my beautiful wife there with the hat on. To the left, and, and you can see this is kind of basically relatively intact, protected wilderness, California coastal uh, um, uh, ecosystem. On the left, you see a barbed wire fence. If you scan over to the left, what you're looking at here is what calls itself a sustainable, organic, grass-fed beef ranch. They even, in their website, say regenerative agriculture, okay? Do you pick up a subtle difference there in the total amount of biomass on that land and, and biodiversity? That multiplied by the land footprint of animal agriculture is the problem in a microcosm. And um, the total amount of biomass that was lost in converting land for animal agriculture is equivalent to best estimate 16 to 18 years worth of total greenhouse gas emissions in terms of, in terms of the amount of, of uh, greenhouse gas impact of that historical transition. And what we're trying to do is what you just saw, which is turn back the clock, replace that wasteland of sustainable grazing with actually healthy ecosystems that store carbon uh, and um, so forth. And this is the last thing I've shared this with Chris. This is a model, it's based on uh, data from uh, uh, and, and modeling programs that the IPCC uses and so forth um, that shows um, what would happen if over the next 15 years, we could phase out animal agriculture, animal-based food production, to uh, um, uh, atmospheric greenhouse gases. The red curve is business as usual. Um, the green curve is what would happen if we just eliminated uh, over a 15-year period uh, animal agriculture, and then the recovery of biomass on that land took about 30 years. And basically what would, and the gray sector is the benefit of reduced ongoing emissions plus the decay of methane, which has a half-life of nine years. Um, it gives you a 40-year pause, a 40-year pause 
in the trajectory of, of um, atmospheric greenhouse gases. And, and you can check the math, okay? This is all publicly available IPCC data and FAO data and so forth. If you combine that with actually net zero fossil fuel emissions by 2060, we could by uh, uh, 2100 turn back the clock to pre uh, um, 21st century levels um, by uh, um, eliminating animals in the food system, okay? Ask me questions about that. And by the way, and this is the last thing. This is the failure of imagination in the climate community, okay? These are all the, the best, the current models for AR6 um, uh, based on their, they, they call these the uh, uh, S, SPP or something like that, different economic scenarios. Um, and and what we're looking at particularly here is their model for what happens to the trajectory of consumption of animal products, okay? And what you'll notice is um, they're not even contemplating the possibility of any significant reduction in animal agriculture. In fact, the large majority of them and the median trajectory um, actually contemplates an almost doubling of consumption of, of animal products, which is utterly insane. So our goal is this green curve and um, and that's that. Sorry, sorry. I just wanted to frame that since this is a you know climate oriented group, and I think most climate scientists don't begin to have a clue of the magnitude of the problem or the magnitude of the opportunity that we have um, if if you know we achieve our goal here. Sorry, sorry for that long digression, but. No, Pat, that was great because one of my questions I didn't get to ask was on, on that climate and LCA analysis. Um, I'm gonna move on to a question by Sabir Dasgupta. Um, Pat, absolutely love the t-shirt. And I was gonna say something too, I, I love the t-shirt as well. Um, what's it, he, uh, Sabir asks, what is the uh, hardest scientific challenge that your company, you and your company currently face? Is it on the taste side, sustainability? or scaling or something else? The biggest challenge and uh, where you're really, if you feel like you're struggling, what area? Well, for sustainability, I think that's not, a, that, that's not really a challenge at all because almost anything we do, literally you'd have to be trying to, you'd have to be desperately trying and even then you probably couldn't succeed in being more destructive and unsustainable than, than the animal-based food system. No, that's, that's a slam dunk. Okay, the um, uh, deliciousness is the, the hardest scientific challenge, okay? Because as I said, nutrition, piece of cake. Uh, uh, um, lower cost, improve food security, piece of cake. Just switch to plant-based plant with any kind of halfway reasonable approach, you, you nail those. Um, um, deliciousness is hard and uh, there are many aspects to it. Uh, the flavor chemistry is part of it. Um, uh, we figured out, you know, a very significant fraction of the flavor chemistry of pretty much animal tissues, um, meats and fish and stuff like that, because a lot of it, it's it's very, uh, uh, when you think about it, like as a, you know, biologist, animal tissues from, you know, animal muscle tissues from, you know, basically Drosophila to humans, are, are fundamentally very similar in molecular terms in what the small molecules are, what the, um, uh, what the proteins are and stuff like that. I don't wanna overstate that, but, but, um, but the basic principles are, are once you understand them for one species, you have most of the answer for most species. So flavor chemistry, I'd say we're pretty far along on uh, um, the um, uh, textural aspects are another completely separate challenge. It doesn't matter if you, if you get the flavor chemistry right, you know, you have beef broth, basically. Um, uh, if, if, if you, uh, so you need to get other things as well. And it's a very complicated set of mechanical properties and, and, and sort of biophysical properties that, that determine the, the, the whole texture, juiciness and stuff like that impact of these products. And, and uh, you know, we're making a lot of progress on that, but there's still a, lot, a long way to go. Um, scaling is, is what I would say the single biggest problem because um, you're talking about an industry that um, uh, is currently producing a trillion pounds of animal products, just the meat, you know, uh, uh, terrestrial animal meat alone is uh, something like 350 billion pounds and fish is 
comparable amount of dairy products and so forth. It's a ton of stuff, okay? And, um, and from a supply chain standpoint, and you know, our supply chain has to be quite different from the incumbent supply chain, so we have to build that out. We're, in, we're extremely conscientious about what the impact of that is from a food security as well as environmental standpoint. Again, the environmental standpoint is easy because we reduce the land footprint by 45% and the water footprint by, uh, you know, we do the land footprint actually by 95%, the, land, the water footprint by 10%, the nitrogen footprint by more than tenfold and stuff like that. You know, uh, that's trivial, um, that's easy. But, but being able to scale up way the supply chain and manufacturing all that sort of stuff to produce this amount of stuff is, is non-trivial, completely doable, but um, uh, you know, that's, that's a lot to do in a short period of time. Um, and, uh, and, you know, and the, the economic scale is huge. It's a, you know, in, in, in 10 years, less than 10 years, it's gonna be a $3 trillion uh, market at wholesale. So that's a good thing in the sense that, you know, there's a big prize for our investors, which helps, help us, helps us raise money. But it's also a, a measure of, of the magnitude of, of, of the scale of this. That's bigger than the, the GDP of, of the UK. Um, so that's a, you know, meaning there's a lot of investment and a lot of, a lot of uh, making stuff required. Yeah, the scaling is a huge issue. And Pat, I have been faced with the criticism um, sometimes in my own work to um, on feeds or whatever. When I'm talking about scale, people say, well, now uh, we're going to be clearing the rainforest of the Amazon to produce all these soybeans. And now you're going to have more climate change. So when you start scaling, even if you're sourcing probably very uh, sustainably produced soybeans, um, there is still the opportunity cost that soybeans will be produced elsewhere. So do you run into this argument? I do, but actually it's, a, and it's one of the most common arguments I run into from very, very smart people. Um, the, the assumption is, well, if we're gonna just, you know, uh, replace all these animal products with products made from plants, well, we're just gonna create another problem, which is we have to grow more plants. Actually, that's based on a complete misunderstanding of, of how that current system works because um, those soybeans are being turned with less than 10% efficiency into pigs and chickens and cows, okay? Um, if we're turning, in, turning them into our meat product, if we're using soybeans, which we are right now, but not necessarily for the long term, um, with essentially 100% efficiency. So you actually counterintuitively not, not only don't you need more plant crops to support our system, you need less, less land devoted to the crops that go into our products than are currently devoted to um, you know, uh, the, the animal-based food industry. So there would not be, and, 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 and incidentally, um, there have been a lot of, lot of studies there, there you know, come out all the time in the scientific literature, uh, on, on what's driving the deforestation in the Amazon. And it's almost entirely uh, clearing land for cattle, not for soybeans. Not that that would be any, not that I'm not, it doesn't matter what you're clearing it for, it's a disaster. So we agree on that, but you're not gonna need to clear, grow, clear more land to grow more soybeans. You can actually grow less soybeans um, and still fully support uh, um, that system. So that's that. Yeah, good, good, excellent. Um, a question from, we have two more questions, I think, for timing. A question from Steve Welker. Hi, Steve. Um, can you compare the benefits of plant-based meat to cell-based meat? How do they, will they coexist in the future? Well, one of the great advantages of plant-based meats, I would say, is existence. Um, because there does not exist a cultured meat. Um, and, and nor will there ever exist a cultured meat that can be scaled economically. And I can give you a million reasons. And, you know, I have lots of familiarity with cell culture, so I, I know what's entailed. I'm going to give you just rather than talk you through the detailed economics of it, I'll just give you a couple of kind of uh, illustrations to get the point across. One is, suppose I said, you know what, the way we're going to uh, um, produce 
beef in the future is we're going to take cells from cows and grow them in culture and blah, blah, blah. Um, it, it would be easier actually to say, no, you know what we're going to do? We're going to, we're going to harvest fetal cows and we're going to wipe out their immune systems um, and, uh, and then feed them intravenously for their entire lives. Um, and uh, that's our, our new system. Well, that's easier in a sense because you don't have to turn, you know, grow those fetal cows or their tissues from, from uh, cells. Um, but you've still got the problem of no immune system and you have to, you're not feeding these cells grass. You're feeding these cells um, uh, very carefully extracted, sterile, you know, pure nutrients um, to enable them to grow, which they then convert very inefficiently into uh, uh, cell mass, and um, and 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 keeping them protected from even a single virus particle because they have got no immune system, or a single bacterial cell getting to that mixture uh, and wiping out your entire you know mega cow. Um, that is completely non-trivial, as anyone who's ever tried to grow anything, even a much faster growing organism in a sterile environment knows. So the economics are a disaster. From a sustainability standpoint, probably worse than the uh, um, uh, whole animal approach. Um, and imagine that it were feasible. Suppose we could actually grow a steak you know, from, from muscle cells. Would you A, would your first move be A, sell it for $5 a pound as food, or sell it for a million dollars a pound to treat people with muscle wasting diseases and so forth. Um, I, you know, and that's not and that's not a thing, by the way, because actually we're not far enough along to even be able to make any kind of remotely reasonable uh, um, cultured replica of a tissue as complex as as a uh, whole muscle. And if we did, like I say, I think our first move would not be serving it as food. The other thing I'll say just as a, a thought experiment is suppose this was 200 years ago and someone said, you know what, horses are actually pretty, uh, um, it's getting out of control. There's too much horse shit in the roads and we have to find a better technology for moving our vehicles. Um, so bingo, here's my genius idea. We're going to culture horse muscle cells um, and, and then um, take those cultured horse, horse muscles and hook them up to gears and pulleys and that will be, you know, the powertrain of the future. Well, I think that's kind of a moronic idea um, because you miss the whole opportunity. The opportunity is actually you're not you're failing to separate the technology that we've always used to serve this function from the essence of that technology and what's valuable from it. That you know what you want is this vehicle to move without you having to push it. And, and we've always used horses for that, but that doesn't mean that's the only way to solve the problem. But if you think of it that way, then you're going to, oh, we're going to culture horse muscle cells. Um, it's the same with food. You know, people just are not separating, recognize the fact that animals are just a technology that we use to produce these foods. They are not the food. They are the technology that we use to produce these foods. The food is defined by its sensory profile, its nutritional value, and stuff like that. Um, so anyway, it's, it's a ridiculous idea. It's never going to be anything. It's not going to be a thing. It's, it's the food of the future, and it always will be. <laughs> we have just time for one more question, really. Um, so sometimes impossible foods has been um, the focus of discussion of you've gone from niche to mainstream um, in fast food joints and all of that. And, um, and are you buying in with the devil on, on that issue? But I think more generally, what's your strategy for um, making this an international food product? Uh, you're in a couple of countries, but you know the big emerging economies and what's your, what's your strategy for, for the international side? Well, for the mo most important thing is that we absolutely intend to be uh, um, selling our product everywhere that that uh, consumers are shopping for meat or fish or dairy foods and so forth. That's and that that of course means uh, uh, international. And um, uh, in order to be at that scale, first of all, there is the underlying problem of. We have to scale our production and supply chain and so forth, which is, 
you know, a heavy lift when there's so much physical stuff being made. It would be nice if this was just an app and all we had to do was clone bits as opposed to uh, um, atoms. But um, um, but anyway, that's that's one aspect, and that's 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 a solvable problem. It's hard. Um, the other thing is that we have at least one ingredient, which is our heme protein, that we produce um, by genetically using genetically engineered yeast. And uh, it's very scalable, and it's, it's very low environmental footprint, vastly lower than covering the plant with cows. And, um, uh, but because it is viewed as a novel ingredient, I'll, I'll just instantly, I'll say, essentially every organism, uh, every multicellular organism has many, many heme proteins. Spinach has more than 100 heme proteins, different heme proteins. Um, heme proteins are so ubiquitous in the human diet, it's like no scientist who, who pays attention to these things thinks it's any kind of a safety issue, but the regulatory groups require to be regulated as a new ingredient and there are bureaucracies and they take time. But we've been through this with a bunch of countries including the US and Canada and uh, now Australia, New Zealand and various others. And, and, and that's just a gating factor, but um, um, we're, I would say, extremely confident for China and Europe and so forth that we'll get to the other end of that. And then, we're, then, then we definitely will be ready to scale um, uh, internationally, and that's our intent. There was another question which I just glossed over. I don't remember what it was. Uh, niche to mainstream? Are you? Oh, niche to mainstream. The devil of Monsanto and McDonald's and all these groups. That okay, here's the, here's the deal. Okay, one approach would be say, you know what, we're just way too proud to sell our products. And you can ask the same question about: Are we going to sell our products in a country whose uh, politics? we don't approve of, okay? Or will we sell it with a vendor whose business practices we don't approve of? Well, what's the alternative? The incumbent industry will be doing it. Consumers will be worse off, worse off uh, um, you know, for not having access to it. And the plan will be vastly worse off. So we cannot be fundamentalists about that. If, if the alternative is someone is, is going to go to that place and buy an animal-based product, the world is better off for us to have our product there uh, to compete. Um, and um, so we just are not fundamentalists about that. We, we are trying to solve the biggest problem the planet faces, probably the biggest problem the planet has ever faced, which is the catastrophic impact of this technology. And um, uh, we're not gonna require perfection um, before we, um, you know, before we do what we need to do. Great. Well, it's time to wrap up. I'm going to turn it over to Chris uh, to end, but I do have 30 second question. Who came up with the name Impossible Foods and why? Well, I, 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 that's a very hard question to answer, although it's, 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 it's because what happened was we, 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 we went through a bunch of names, okay? Uh, um, we've had, you know, the, the name of the company from a corporation standpoint or whatever paperwork standpoint went from Meat 2.0, which was never intended to be a public, uh, uh, public in own name, it was when we were in stealth, to uh, Sandhill Foods, which is kind of a joke, um, uh, but a very inside joke for Silicon Valley types. Um, and uh, then Meraxi, which is uh, also kind of a very inside uh, joke because it's the uh, word for leaf in the language of the Costanoan people who are the indigenous people of the Bay Area. Um, not, though they were never intended to be a brand name. Then we realized we're gonna be a commercial company. We have to have a brand name that actually kind of uh, uh, has some impact with people. And we went through uh, and we worked with a, a, a naming company uh, that is a highly regarded naming company. And we were the worst customer they ever had. Like they would, they would serve us have a bunch of names. And we, they, they recommended like 300 names. And, you know, time after time, I'd say, these names all suck. Try again. And uh, because they really did suck. I mean, they're, you know. Uh, and um, uh, finally, one of their 40 names was impossible. And as soon as I saw it, I thought, and, and the nice thing that these naming companies do, by the way, is they vet them for trademark issues and and weird translation issues. Is, it, is this a swear word in, you know, uh, uh, Swahili or something like that? And uh, then they serve up the names. So they do a lot of work, but then they keep coughing up horrible names. 
But anyway, they finally uh, served up Impossible Foods. And as soon as I saw it, I thought, okay, bang, we're done. Great. Okay, Chris, over to you. Okay, to well, <clears throat> let me just go with a really quick thanks, Roz. Fascinating conversation. Pat, uh, a real tour de force in, in how to uh, disrupt and build at the same time. You know, I never heard the story of your proposal to the Woods Institute being turned down. That was either the dumbest thing the Institute ever did or, or given the trajectory that the companies followed, maybe it was the smartest. But uh, I think for all of us, the vision that you've laid out is one of how thinking really differently about what's the nature of a problem can lead to a, to a wide range of, of, of really impactful solutions. We certainly wish you the very best for the future from possible and the best for the, for the world. Uh, thanks again today to, um, to our technical team behind the scenes, Molly Field, Athena Serapio and Justin Warren. And thanks to everybody who joined us today for a set of really fascinating questions and a conversation that I hope really is changing the world. So long. Thanks a lot, uh, Chris and Ross.